On Christmas Day, 1977, the body of a black male was found in a culvert in Floyd County, Indiana. He was shot in the head and was believed to have died a day before his discovery. He was estimated to be between 18 and 25 years of age. He was six feet tall and weighed around 170 pounds. He wore a knit cap, a jacket with the letters E and D on the front pocket. He also wore a black shirt, a blue sweatshirt, bluish pants, and white tennis shoes. Several of his teeth were also missing. While doing some more research on this case of this um, unidentified victim who was found in Floyd County, Indiana, I did find some more stories, uh, some more links that gave a little bit more detail about him. It says that his state of remains were not recognizable, that he had traumatic injuries, and that his cause of death was a gunshot wound to the head. He was thought to be between the ages of 18 and 25. He was a black male, 6 foot tall, and weighing around 170 pounds. It says here that he had a large wound type scar on his right arm on the inside of his right elbow. He was missing um, two teeth on top and three on bottom. He was wearing all pro white tennis shoes size 12. Uh, the victim was located in a drain culvert on US 150 by two hunters in Floyd County, Indiana on Christmas Day 1977. He had no identification and his cases and he has never been identified. This case is being handled by the Indiana State Police and their phone number is 812-246-5424. There wasn't a lot of information on this man. A um, couple of things I found on Web Sleuths where people were just, you know, trying to compare him to other missing people or other unidentified people. The hunters discovered the body of a young black man near Indiana 335 and US 150. He had been shot in the head. Probably one day he had been deceased. Police think the victim was either in his late teens to mid-twenties. He was six foot tall and weighed about 170 pounds. He had a large scar on his arm and was missing several teeth. Investigators have pieced together a theory of what happened based on a tip that they received from someone who told them about two men. The tipster said that they, he had heard rumors that these two men may have been involved. The story was that the man, the, the deceased man, had been picked up in Louisville, Kentucky and was panhandling for money. The two men picked him up and brought him to Indiana. Um, the police believe that the tips were valid due to some of the things that were found at the crime scene that the public had not heard about. And this tipster was, you know, giving the police some information that they, you know, thought was accurate. One thing was that the victim was dressed in layers. It was believed that the man had was a homeless person and had been on the streets of Louisville, Kentucky, panhandling. And they believed that he could have been homeless because he was wearing several layers of clothes. He was wearing two jackets and three pairs of pants. So they think that he was dressed in layers because maybe he was out on the streets or and and December the twenty fifth it would have been somewhat cold weather or it could have been that he just didn't have any way to carry his items, so he just wore everything that he had. Um some people believe that he may have been released from jail because the windbreaker and the um, cap, the, he was wearing a type of a toboggan type of hat or cap. 
and the windbreaker and the shoes that he was wearing, some people believe might have come from a jail. This would have been standard clothing that they would have worn in the jails. Now, I think that would have been somewhat easy for them to search local jails um, that maybe had those types of clothes. I don't know. I, it's just a theory, and, and other people have. Um, so back to the tipster. The tipster said that the man had been panhandling on the streets of Louisville, Kentucky, when two men picked him up and brought him to Indiana and told him that they were going to buy him some alcohol. But police were never able to connect the two men to the crime. One, police were never able to connect the men to the crime. One man died, and the second man died a few weeks ago. Now, this article was written um, in 2012, so this was all I could really find. There hasn't been anything more updated. It just says that when the police did go out to speak to the one man who was still living, um, because he was ill, he was sick, and they went out to speak to him because they were afraid that he may pass away, he told them a few things that helped reinforce the belief that he knew something about this crime, but he didn't make any admissions. He declined to give the man's name if he knew it, Police asked them to do one thing and give them the man's identity if he knew it. This would help to bring closure to the man's family. The man um, is now buried in a grave in Greenville Township. So the one good thing about that is they have his remains. They didn't cremate them because keep in mind this took place in the 70s. So, um, they didn't know about DNA or anything then. It's possible now that his DNA could be entered into databases, and maybe they will get a hit somewhere. We'd like to identify him and find out if he had any family members so that they may bring, it may bring some peace to their minds. Someone made this um, comment on a Facebook page concerning this story. They said that the area where he was located had a 1% at that time. Now, I don't know about now, but this was in the 70s. They said it only had a 1% African American population and that people would likely know of the black families from that area because there weren't that many. Well, just because the man was found there doesn't mean he was from there and if it's true that he was from Louisville Kentucky and he was living on the streets he may not have had any family he could have been from anywhere they were comparing him to um, missing people as far as Arkansas someone suggested that he may have been older than they were um, estimating because he had a receding hairline. Um, they believe that he could have been as old as uh, 30 or older, even though the police said they believed he to be him to be in his teens to late to early to mid 20s. Someone said that it looked like he had had short braids all over the top of his head that had been cut off um, kind of in a um, quick manner, like not done professionally, but just cut off. Um, did they take fingerprints off this guy? If he had been in jail, as some people suggest, did they not run fingerprints through to see if he matched anywhere? Now, with the passing of time and... Um, with new technology, you would think. And I did a story not too long ago on a woman named Shotgun Jane Doe who was found murdered in Knoxville, Tennessee. And after 30 
some years, her uh, fingerprints were put into a database and matched to an arrest that she'd had years earlier in California, and they were able to find her identity that way. There is one man that they were that has been missing and that they were trying to find out if it could have been him. And this man's name was Henry Lewis Baltimore Jr. Um, Henry Lewis Baltimore Jr. went missing on May the 30th, 1973 from East Lansing, Michigan. He was classified as endangered and missing. He's a black male. Um, he was born January the 16th, 1952. He was 21 at the time that he went missing. He was six foot two, 175 pounds. He was wearing a black sweater, light gray slacks, and black and gray shoes. He was driving a 1968 Buick and his car was found. He had black hair and brown eyes and he was wearing an Afro style haircut at the time. He was last seen in East Lansing, Michigan on May the 30th, 1973. He was a junior at Michigan State University at the time. He was studying social science and music. He was an honors student and he was also a co-drum major in the marching band. He was considered quite musically talented and he also had a job in the university library. His car was found at his home about an hour and a half after he was last seen. He also left behind his car keys, his money, clothing, and other belongings. At the time of his disappearance, he had three roommates at an off-campus apartment in the 300 block of Oak Hill Avenue. Baltimore was discovered missing when his sister went to his apartment to get some papers she had agreed to type for him. He wasn't there and his roommate said he had gone to the library and never came back. His sister became concerned when, his, when the due date for his paper came and went without her hearing from him. Now, if he'd gone to the library, why did he not take his car? Did he live close enough to walk? In March of 1973, Baltimore went to the police and reported that two male attackers had tied him to his bed, beat him with a pistol, and stole $110, a golf bag, a watch and some clothing. He said he waited 10 days to report them because he was afraid that they would come back. One suspect in this robbery was Roy L. Davis. He was arrested and charged with armed robbery. Baltimore was fined $50 for failing to appear at the preliminary hearing to testify against him. He resurfaced two days later and asked the police to drop the case, but they refused. He later testified at a hearing. Baltimore told his sister that Davis had threatened to kill him and his family if he testified. This had caused him a great deal of stress. Baltimore disappeared two days before Davis's arraignment on June the 1st. Neighbors stated that they saw Davis knocking on Baltimore's door the day he went missing. Later that year, Davis pled guilty to felonious assault with intent to commit robbery. He was sentenced to six months in jail. He has never been charged in connection with Baltimore's disappearance, and he says he has an alibi for that day. This was, this was backed up by his mother. As of 2020, Davis is believed to still be alive and living in the Tulsa, Oklahoma area. Baltimore was a Cub Scout and a Jackson Citizen Patriot delivery boy. He graduated from Parkside High School in Jackson, Michigan in 1970. Authorities initially believed he went into hiding so he would not have to testify against Davis but the length of time that has passed makes this unlikely. His, never, his family never thought this. They never believed that he left voluntarily. He always stayed in close contact with them. 
Um, Baltimore's father and two of his brothers have died, but his mother and his remaining siblings are still looking for him. Foul play is suspected in his case. Now, 1977, this would have been four years after he disappeared that this man was found dead in Indiana. But the best way to do that would be through DNA. I would assume that this Baltimore's family have given their DNA and put their DNA out there in the um, event that, you know, he may turn up or that his um, remains may turn up. But either way, as of right now, um, this Baltimore remains missing after 50 years. Um, he would be in his 70s now. He's never tried to contact any of his family, so chances of him being alive are very slim. I would say more than likely um, there was some foul play. I, I mean, the police do believe that as well. As for the man unidentified who was shot in the head, I don't know why people would have picked up a homeless person from the street in Louisville, Kentucky, driven to Indiana, and then shot the man in the head, unless it was a personal. It sounded more personal. It sounded like someone who knew this man. The story about this panhandler on the streets, he could have had some money on him, but from panhandling, I doubt that he had a whole lot of money. Unless these two men were just, you know, decided to go out and, and shoot someone in the head and kill them that day. Unless they knew him personally, or this was a robbery, I can't understand, you know, their motive. Hopefully one day this man's DNA has been entered, I don't know, I couldn't find anything about that. If I do find out anything more on either of these two stories, I will come back and do a follow-up. And thanks for watching.